talk about the second and the seven letters um, that um, John wrote to the churches of Asia Minor. Um, and this one's the church at Smyrna. Um, and as I spoke last week, and let me put my, my little map up here, um, you can see um, on the map that basically where what John wrote is the exact order. If you can see, it starts at Ephesus, it goes up and around and comes down all the way down to Laodicea, which was the last church that John wrote to. Um, it's interesting, history tells us that that is the exact route that the Roman legions took when they came in and began to just overtake everything. There was a lot of rebellion going on. There was a lot of stuff happening. Um, and when Titus and his, and his legions came into the area, he came in that way and, and came across that way. So this is the reason that John is writing this letter. The Holy Spirit spoke to him. God said, I want you to write to these churches. Let them know what, what they're going through at the present time and what's coming down the road. They need to be aware of and they need to know that I've got this. I mean, if, if to me, it's like the book of Revelation to me um, isn't so much about, well, who's the Antichrist going to be, what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, all that kind of stuff. Um, to me, the book of Revelation is all about God just showing up and saying, you know what, I've got this. I've had it all along. I've had it all along. I've got this. And, and, and so there, there's nothing, you know, a lot of people talk about, well, there, there's fear and all that. And I just don't, that's not my God. God doesn't give us stuff to scare us. God gives us stuff to give us faith. And, and to be able to trust him and know that he's, he's got the thing going on. So all of these churches that he was instructed, John was instructed by the risen Christ to write to these churches. Each one of them are going through some various different things that are going on. And he's writing to encourage them. Um, at Ephesus, basically the bottom line to that church was, hey, let's fall, why don't you fall back in love with me again? Fall in love with me again, all over again. And let's let that start. And it's interesting that after Ephesus comes Smyrna, which the chief message to Smyrna is this, just, just hang on, you're going to be all right. And it's interesting that the first thing God does through John is he tells, because the, these letters would not have just gone to one church or one city. They would have made their way around, just like all the other New Testament letters, all the epistles that... Paul wrote and, and Peter and the Gospels, they were basically circular letters, if you will. One church would read them and they would pass them on. And Paul even talks about in one of his letters, he says, take the letter that I wrote to you and make sure that you get it to this other church or this other community, and then you read the letter that I sent to them. So that's how that's how the Word of God spread back then, was that they would go and they would travel and, and, and they would pass these things along. So it's interesting that after Ephesus, they go to Smyrna and the Ephesus, and the um, the message to Smyrna, as we're going to see here in a bit, um, was primarily this. They were getting ready to go through some pretty serious persecution. Um, not only, and, and it was interesting, the persecution that was coming was not just from the Romans as they came in. It was from, literally, it was from the Jews who lived there were persecuting the Christians as well. So if you were a Christian and you happened to live in Smyrna, you were catching it both ways. You were catching it from from the Jewish individuals who didn't believe in Jesus, they, they, they just didn't buy into that whole crucifixion and resurrection thing. And honestly, they were in a position in this city, we'll see in a moment, that they had, a, they had it pretty good in this city. It was a very wealthy city. Um, it was one of the chief cities. Actually, Smyrna and Ephesus were called the first cities of Asia. And what that meant was that as a first city, there was, they were the first city um, of, of that region that Rome actually um, acknowledged and gave special attention to, that Rome actually um, made them special. They, they were because of their situation geographically, they were right on prime seaports where all of the trade took place. So these were very important cities. Um, Rome got a lot of tax money and that type of stuff coming through there. A lot of stuff going on there. Um, so th these cities were pretty important. And in fact, um, it was in Ephesus and it was in Smyrna where quite literally the, the um, practice of offering a sacrifice to Caesar and to Rome started in these cities. Um, what you would do is people would come and they would there would be an idol there or it might be an image of the Caesar at the time. And actually for Smyrna, it was Tiberius Caesar. 
Um, and, and Tiberius was the first one of the Caesars that demanded that um, his, his uh, uh, subjects offer sacrifice to him. And so what they would have to do is they would take and they would take some incense and there would be the idol that would be there and they would throw it into the fire pot or the furnace that was there. Um, and then after that, they had to say, um, they, they had to say all praise to Caesar. It wasn't all hail, it was all praise to Caesar. As if, because Caesar was considered a god at this time. Um, it started with Tiberius, that was the first one, and, and it kind of, it just got worse from there um, as it went along. And so what would happen is if you did not offer the sacrifice or offer the incense offering and make and, and swear allegiance to not only the Roman Empire, but to Caesar at that time, um, more than likely uh, you would be, you would be, first of all, you'd be arrested, you would be in prison, you would be tortured unbelievably, and generally you would end up being being killed, executed. And what made it what made it worse was um, not just, but for the Jews it was even worse because our not the Jews, but if you were a Christian, the Jews hated you just as much because, of course, the Christians. First of all, you were Gentile for Pete's sake, and, and you know, and, and and literally, I read somewhere that literally that that it was not uncommon for Jewish individuals, especially those that were were um, in the religious, you know, the scribes, the Pharisees. And that the first thing they would do when they woke up and their feet hit the floor is that um, um, God, I thank you today that I was born neither Gentile nor woman. That's what they would say. That was their, their prayer. Um, because Gentile, they considered them dogs and they didn't consider women much more than that. Um, and, and so this whole thing of, of so they, they were catching it, the poor Christians, they were catching it from both ways, from the Romans and then from their own, you know, many times the Jews that were there because there was a very strong Jewish community in Smyrna and in Ephesus. Um, so Christians were looked down upon. Um, they weren't liked. Um, as far as the Jews were concerned, simply because they um, basically said that the law of Moses wasn't enough, that there was this guy by the name of Jesus who died on a cross and was rumor had it that he had resurrected from the dead, that they, they thought it was just a slap in the face to, to Judaism in particular and to the whole law of Moses. Um, because of this one, they had this thing, they had this crazy idea that somehow Jesus, by his death and resurrection, basically fulfilled the law of Moses and all the Old Testament. Therefore, he was the Messiah. And they, they, they had this crazy notion about that. Well, I'm just going to say that, you know, I mean, here they were the scribes and Pharisees, the people who knew the law the best of anyone, and yet they didn't know their Messiah was in their midst. Yeah. I, I just find that yeah. baffling. Well, it's because, it's, it's because here, here's the deal. The, the, the reason was is because he didn't come in the way that they thought he was going to come. They, they, their Messiah was, in their mind, their Messiah was coming to throw off the yoke of Rome and to throw off the bondage of the Gentiles and to establish the, the, the kingdom forever and the Jews were going to rule the world. That was their mindset. That's what they were, that's what they were taught. Um, you know, that there was going to be that Messiah was coming to establish the throne of David over all the world and that type of thing. Well, they didn't realize that, yeah, that's true. That is going to take place. They just didn't see the first part of it that, first of all, Messiah had to come and take care of this little issue called sin. Then he was going to be able to establish, you know, the kingdom. Um, so they were catching, Christians were catching it both ways here. And, and it was not unlike, um, matter of fact, Smyrna was one of the first places where they began to do really, um, really nasty things like um, stitch people up in animal skins, turn them loose, and let wild dogs hunt them down and, and, and capture and kill them and eat them. Um, they did weird things like um, they, they had this thing. I forget what the name of it was, but it was this giant metal um, image, and they would they would set they would build a fire in it until that thing got red hot. They would take people, and part of their favorite pastime was taking Christians, putting them in that thing, locking them in there, and then lighting the fire and basically cooking them alive. Um, they did all kinds of weird stuff like that, and uh, Smyrna was one of the places that that began to happen. And especially if you came in and had anything negative to say. Um, you didn't swear allegiance to Rome and to the, and to the Caesar of the time. That was basically an automatic death sentence. Um, and they came up, the Romans invented new ways to make death cruel. So that's where we're at um, in this. And, and, and 
Uh, <coughs> Revelation chapter 2. Um, let's see, make sure I got that. There we go. Um, we find these words. John writes these words, and God is speaking to him, or the risen Christ is speaking in him. He says, To the angel, or the pastor, or the messenger of the church in Smyrna, write, These are the words of him who is first, who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. Um, why do you think that the risen Lord would make that the very first thing that he's telling these people? Letting them go to the viewers in control in the beginning, it will be in control at the end. Okay. What else? Well, the resurrection was what everything was based on, that he was, in fact, God. Okay. The resurrection, yep. Yep. In, in, in a very real way, because of what they are going through, he's letting them know look, I died. And I came to life again. And he also told them, he said, and because I live, you will live also. So what he's doing is he's saying right from the very beginning of this, he's saying, look, number one, you need to remember this. Um, you know, I am the first and the last who died and came to life again. Because these, like I said, if you read the accounts, and you can go back into Fox's Book of Martyrs and read some of that stuff, and it is ungodly what they would do to people, um, what, they would, what they would do to the, uh, to the Christians and, and just for sport and for games, um, to entertain themselves. Um, it's kind of, have you ever seen the movie Gladiator? You ever seen the movie Gladiator? And, and, and there's the one scene where he's done and he's just totally, you know, he squat off all these people as a gladiator and all this, and they're, they're still shouting everything, and he hollers, I said, what? Are you not entertained? And all this and it's a great scene in the movie. And that's what it was all about. It, it, was, it was that, you know, give the people what they want. They want blood. And so that's what they did. Whatever it took to keep the people happy. Um, that's what the Caesars did. But it's interesting that Jesus, at the very beginning with John, is kind of look, tell, this is, the, you know, give them the words who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. These are the words that you're supposed to tell them. So he's letting them know Look, this happened to me, but because I live, you're going to live also. So physical death isn't all there is, that there's something beyond that. I know your afflictions and your poverty, okay? Um, yet you are rich. So Jesus is, is hitting on some very, number one, the afflictions of this. If you did not, if you did not give allegiance to Caesar by, by offering the incense... No matter what your trade was or what your skill was or your job was, you would immediately lose your job. Which meant if you couldn't work, you wasn't eating. So literally, it put people into an, into an, incre just a, a, an immediate sense of poverty. And what was even worse is that if you were Jewish, because a lot of the Jews, what was happening, they would offer the set because they wanted to work. They wanted their jobs. It was their livelihood. They would do that. But the reality is, is that the ones who didn't, they were immediately ostracized. Many of them were either arrested and tortured. But the Jews were doing it to their own people because they were so afraid of the Romans. What they would do is if there was a, a Christian, which Jews and Christians didn't get along real well back then, um, that they, they, they hated Matter of fact, if you read you read the epistles of Paul, usually the first groups that came after Paul and that, that went and and tried to kill him and, and do all the stuff to him wasn't wasn't the Romans, it was the Jews um, in the given cities that, that came after him. Um, so all of this stuff, they've lost their jobs, which meant if they don't have jobs, they would lose their property, and most of the time they were put in slavery. And extreme bondage and slavery. So Jesus is saying right from the very beginning, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews, but are not, but are really a synagogue of Satan. And we'll get into that one in a little bit more in depth in, in, in a minute. So he, he's, he's, and he's talking about, Jesus is talking about people that say they're Jews, but they're really not um, Paul said it like this, their circumcision is of the flesh, but not of the heart. Okay? In other words, they, were, they, they had a form of godliness, but they were going through the motions, and if you didn't agree with them or anything else, then they would turn on you in a heartbeat, just as they did Jesus. Um, 
So he's dealing with all of this and he talks about the synagogue of Satan, <coughs> excuse me, in Smyrna because of their idol worship. Um, they, they had a whole bunch of different gods. They worshiped Caesar. They had a lot of other idol gods that they would worship. Um, and, and so th this whole thing that, that this was the very, and, and it's interesting, and we'll get to it at the end. I'm just going to kind of wet your appetite a little bit. It's interesting. There is a definite reason why Jesus is speaking this part. Um, who say they're Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. There's a reason he's putting that out there at the very beginning. Because what he's wanting them to get the, get the gist of is that these people are motivated by Satan. These people are influenced by Satan. And so what, he, what he's coming down to toward the end, he's going to talk about um, showing love to people. In other words, you know what? you got to remember the spirit. These people don't even realize what spirit they're of. They don't realize what's going on. They don't realize what they're... What they, they don't re realize, you know, and even with Jesus, they, they didn't realize what they were doing. Father, forgive them. And why did Jesus ask them to forgive them? They didn't even realize what they were doing. So... The risen Lord who made that statement from the cross as He was about to die turns around and through John and He's telling His followers who are un dying in unbelievable ways and being murdered, He's trying to in in instill in them the same thing. They don't realize what they're doing. They don't realize what they're doing. Now think about the day and the age that we live in today. There's a whole lot of ungodly stuff going on. Right? I mean, just unbelievable stuff that's going on today. I mean, I can't, I can't, I, it, it boggles my mind that really in, in a day and an age where we have such education and, and, and the ability to think and, and all that kind of stuff, that we literally are having to argue about whether an infant inside its mother's uterus is really a person or not. Doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, when, when does a, when does a, a, um, when does a dog become a dog? Is it a dog inside the inside the, the mama the mama's belly, inside the mama's uterus? Is it, is it a dog at that point, yeah. or does it wait until it till the, the dog, you know, gives birth that it, then it becomes a puppy? It, it's, it's, it boggles my mind that we're even having those kind of arguments. Say, when do, when does life really begin? At conception. When does it when does it happen? Amen. Brother, I'm, I'm with you on that. You know? Because the Bible says that from before I was formed in my mother's womb. Yes. You, you knew... Before you, we were yeah. in the womb. Before, before we were even formed. You know, God, God knew us. He knew us by name and, and all of that kind of stuff. So, you know, so this, what we're dealing with today in the, in the 21st century is not new. It's not new. Well, it was going on right back then. When you try to change God's law... You got to get rid of God to change it. Sure, sure. That's what this is yeah. all about. Yeah, because yeah. you know God's in the way here. The stuff yeah. that they're trying yeah. to do immorally wrong. Yeah, is Christianity saying no? We got our own book to live by here. Yeah, called the Bible. Yeah, what you guys are doing is wrong. They're saying get rid of church. Get rid of church. Yeah, and and here's and here's the deal. And it's interesting that you that you, that you say that, Dennis, because. When we get through the rest of this letter here, it comes down to the point that really what Jesus is communicating to the people is that, hey, number one, I've got this. Number two, He wants to instill in them a spirit of Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. They don't realize what they're doing. And, and, and it's like, that boggles my mind. But yet, the Bible also says that, that, that the prince of darkness comes in and he darkens the understanding and he blinds the eyes of individuals to where they, they don't think straight and they don't think in ways like that. So he's going he's gonna to deal with this in, in a moment. So he's letting them know right up front, hey, I know about the slander of those who say they're Jews, but they're really not. They're religious people. They claim they are, whatever the case may be, but they're of the synagogue of Satan. Notice that the risen Lord is not saying these people are bad people. He's saying they're under a bad influence and what I came to do was release them from that influence so that they can live in the way that I created them to live. It's really what it's boiling down here, down to here. Um, so he goes on in verse 10. He says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. He just puts it out there. It's going to get bad. 
It's going to get bad. Here's the deal. God forbid, but we don't know. We don't know as believers. We really don't know if we might not end up in a place where we have to suffer. I know we don't like it. And as Americans, we really hate to think about that. We really hate to think about that. You know, because we, and I thank God for this country. I thank God for all the, all the, you know, all the things that make this country great. But the reality is, is that we very well could end up in that kind of situation. But the reality of it is this, is that Jesus is saying, look, he's not even playing around. He said, look, in case you might have to suffer, don't be afraid. He's not even good. He's not even couching it in those terms. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. In other words, it's coming. It's coming. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. Notice who he says is going to do it. Notice who he says is going to do it. He didn't say that the Romans were going to do it. He didn't say that some of your own people were going to do it. What he's saying is that the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. A couple of things on this. Number one is that we have to understand that when God created us, he created us good. All right? He created us perfect. We were created in his image. And because of sin, because of Satan, because of all the stuff we read about, that is what is, has totally changed everything. But yet he's still saying, look, this is Satan's doing. You know, if Mike's being mean to me and taking my, and taking my potato chips and all that kind of stuff and, and poking holes in my tires and all that kind of stuff, you know, I could say, I could say, well, that Mike, he's just a really bad dude. He's just really bad. The reality is, is that how many of you understand that all of us, May not, maybe not to the degree that Mike was, but all of us were in that same boat. We were lost and undone without God. We were lost and undone without God. We may not have, we may not have, have sinned in the same manner that other people have sinned, but isn't it, ama isn't, it, isn't, it, isn't it amazing how it's so easy to quantify sin? What's a bad sin? Well, that's not really. Bad. It's just kind of not so bad. So. No, Jesus, the Lord sees it all the same. So the deal is here, he's saying, and he's wanting us to, he's wanting the people in the church to say, look, this isn't about the people around you. I died for them just like I died for you. The devil will put some of you in prison. Well, and we have to remember too that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the dark. Come on. The yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, so, so a, a lot of the stuff that we're doing um, in, in, in just, and in, in how we're, we're, we're broaching some of this, some of the stuff that's happening, with, we, we, sometimes we think, well, and I thank God for our liberties. I thank God for the Constitution. I thank God for all of those things that give us the ability to do the stuff that we do. But the reality is, is that as believers, it's not the con the Constitution didn't die for us. A lot of people bled and died in support of the Constitution, but the Constitution isn't what saved us. You know the the the, the all the different things that you know the Pledge of Allegiance and, and our form of government and, and all those things that is not what saved us. What saved us was Jesus Christ. Amen. You know the, the, that that's that's who saved us. That's what saved us. And and we have to remember that you know just like Paul said, we don't wage war as the world does because our weapons are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We have to ask ourselves sometimes: Are we getting are we are we getting our heads out of kilter a little bit and trying to fight in ways that God never created and, and deemed for us to fight with? I mean, the greatest, you know, I remember there was a song that was out a long time ago. It's time to, um, it's time to get on your knees and fight like a man. In other words, pray. You, do, you, go, you go to prayer. You know, yes, do we do the other stuff we have to do? Of course we do. But the reality that we have the ability to do because we live where we live. We've been given the freedom and the rights. Although some of those, some, there are some out there that want to take some of that away. But the reality is, is that the greatest weapon that we have is not the ballot box. It's not protesting. The greatest weapon we have is getting on our face before, before a holy God and saying, God, we throw ourselves on your mercy. Lord, have mercy. 
have mercy on us. Have mercy on our nation. You know, forgive us. Um, stay, you know, that idea of, um, what was it? I believe it was in Ezekiel. Um, when, when in the book of Ezekiel, where he talked about making, uh, the, you know, I looked for a man who would stand, you know, who would stand at the hedge and make up the gap in the hedge, but I could find no one who would stand there for the nation. Um, you know, I, I, I'll just go ahead and say this. Um, so if I get in trouble, if you, if y'all watching from home, if you don't like this, just send it to um, um, Pastor Crisco at RCC for me. <laughs> okay. Um, I believe this. I wonder if we spent half as much time on our knees before God and fasting and prayer and crying out to God um, on behalf of our nation and on behalf of people around us. I wonder if we spent half as much time as we do doing some of the other things that we do, how much better would our nation be? Yes. Amen. What, 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 what would happen? Just, just, I'm just asking. And, and, and so, you know, he's talking, he wants us to understand, look, the devil is going to do this and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Yes, ma'am. So, all through the, Jesus, the disciples, all through the New Testament has been teaching us of this. Mm -hmm. Rejoice in your sufferings. You will be persecuted. Count it all joy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's the same message all the way through the New Testament. Yeah. That you will suffer persecution. Yeah. And then and, you will be victorious through it. Yeah. And the thing of it is, is that, isn't it amazing as human beings? We love to focus on the victorious. We don't like that first part too much, you know. I, I, I want, yes, I want, yeah, hallelujah. I want to live in victory, glory to God. I don't want, I don't want to go through this other stuff, though. I don't want to mess with it. Um, but the reality is, is that, you know, but the, here's, here's a little bit of a hint of where John is going with his message from the risen Lord. He says, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. What the, I've often wondered, what, what 10 days? Well, let's see here. If I put on my theology hat, 10 days could be 10 years, could be 10 decades, could be all this stuff. Not just this, and in, and in Greek, it's a really hard, it's a hard phrase to understand. 10 days... Um, in Greek means ten days, literally, is what it means. And but but it's an analogy. You got to remember, you're talking about a book that that, that is that is um, um, apocalyptic, and and so what he, what he's doing, he's using it as an analogy, saying that literally, just as ten days really isn't anything, he's letting them know, look, you're going to go through this, but it's not going to last forever. It's not going to last forever. You're going to come through this. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Man. But I, I can just say that, you know, we have to keep our eyes on that. When we're going through sufferings yeah. and persecution and trials, yeah. we have to keep our eyes on the Word, which is what He was telling them to yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. That's how you get through it. Yeah. And that's how you become, you know, Successful yeah. and victorious. And I think, and I think, you know, I try to as I read a lot of this stuff, I try to picture it in my head. Can you imagine John? He's on the Isle of Patmos, which was a place where they sent prisoners. It was a basically a penal colony, and um, he's there because of his testimony of Jesus and and all of that, and he's seeing all of this stuff, and. In the midst of all of this, he's given, he's given the, the vision. He, he has an encounter with the risen Christ who basically has, he's holding, in, in the, the analogy of last week, he's holding these, these seven churches in his hand. So the, the, the thing of it is, is that can you imagine what... what, what when you, when you think, and, and, I'm, and I'm sure the whole thing of 10 days wasn't literally 10, 24-hour days. I'm sure it was just giving that there was, there was going to be a beginning to it, but there was a definite end to it. Okay? Um, but that, the idea of it is, is compare that to the glory of the risen Lord. Compare this. I mean, think about your worst day that you can remember. <laughs> Think about the worst day you ever had. Now compare it to standing face to face to the risen Lord and all of His glory. You forget about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it, it, it pales in comparison to what, and all of a sudden it's like all of this back here. 
It doesn't matter. You know, um, used to be an old song. Old, old, old song. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of the earth will strangely dim in the light of what? And of His glory and grace. You know, hey, there's something about some of the old songs. I love the new song, but there's some stuff in the old songs too, you know. And, and, and it's like, that, that's what he's getting across. Look, be faithful even to the point of death. A whole lot of these people are going to die martyrs' deaths. A lot of them. It is said in Fox's Book of Martyrs that there were times when literally they would take the Christians and they would take a bunch of them and they would, they would burn them at the stake together in the, in the middle of the... the um, of the arenas and different things they had in all these cities. And they would light them. And as they are going up in flames, the Christians would begin to sing hymns to the Lord as the flames were consuming their body. The Bible tells us, our history tells us, that there were people in the crowds. That was like, dude, that was like the Super Bowl to those people. They would, they would pay good money to go and sit in those things to see people go up in flames. Messed up people. But yet, as those Christians would sing, as they are breathing their last breath, um, Fox's Book of Martyrs says that there are, there are countless written testimonies of people in those, in those arenas and in those auditoriums that would end up beginning to weep because they could not believe that those people believed in something so strong that they would be willing to die for it. And that they, and, and they wanted what they had. And so instead of stamping out Christianity, it ended up spreading it even further. It was unreal. So be faithful, even to the point of death, and I'll give you life um, as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. We think the first death is bad. And you know what? Hey, I've last couple of years I've gone through losing my losing my parents. It's not fun. It's not fun. There is comfort in the fact I knew both of them were Christians. I knew they were with Jesus. There was comfort in that, but there's still, there's sorrow. There's grief, right? There's grief. But the, the, the idea here is that because I know that my parents love Jesus, I know because of the way they raised me, I know that they love Jesus, that what they went through, and I mean, and I can't even begin to fathom what it's like to, to end your last days looking at people in a room and you don't even know who they are and you gave birth to them and you raised them and you took care of them and all of that you you went through all the stuff with them but they don't even they don't even know who you are. But they weren't alone. No, they were alone. They were alone. No, they were. And and the fact of it is is that can you imagine that even though they go through that here there's this thing known as the second death, which in that day and age, what they wrote about it was talking about um, it was it was talking about eternal eternal death. It was talking about being away from God. It was talking about hell. It was talk whatever name you want to put on it. That's what it was talking about. But he's saying to them, look, look at me. I went through it. I went through it. I am alive forevermore. And because I live, you will live also. But that doesn't just mean here on this. On, on what we can touch and feel, there, there is that point where, where there is nothing that can, that can touch you anymore. That, that whole aspect of um, you won't be hurt at all by the second death. In other words, eternal separation from God. What we would call hell, what we would call, you know, whatever, lake of fire, whatever, you know, doesn't matter what you call it. The fact is that I don't, I don't, think, I don't think it's the fire that's what's going to be so painful. I think it's the fact of knowing that, that what you could have had and what you could have done and what you could all those things and now you're separated from God because of that I think that's the torment to me that would be can you imagine can you imagine when Jesus talked about Lazarus the rich man and Lazarus which by the way we all think that's a parable but there's nothing in the Bible that says that that was a parable I believe Jesus was given an account of something that was probably pretty real where Lazarus you know he was he was he was the, the or, um, yeah Lazarus was the beggar and all that kind of stuff that sat out there and the dogs would come and lick him and, and the rich man and all this stuff and then all of a sudden the rich man dies and, and he wakes up in hell and he's screaming because he's in torment. And, and here Lazarus is, the Bible says that Lazarus is in Abraham's bosom which was a, a connotation of what um, their understanding of heaven was at that, at that particular time. Um, and, and, and he's looking at that and, and this is what 
um, the Lord says to the, to the rich man, He says, all your life you had everything. And you didn't do one thing to relieve this man's suffering. You know, you buy your ticket, you take the ride. And, and so, you know, he's saying that this, the one who is victorious and will not be hurt at all by the second death. So what he's talking about is that, look, you guys, hang on. This is not going to last forever. It's not going to last forever. And, and so he's trying to encourage them. But there's a few things that I want to um, touch on tonight. Um, and just talk about some of this stuff, um, some of the, the historical stuff, the geographical stuff, and then, then um, four things that, that are really unique about this book. First of all, Smyrna was about 40 miles up the coast from Ephesus. Um, it would have been the next stop for the postman after he had visited Ephesus. Um, Smyrna was a bit like Ephesus in the sense that it was large, more affluent. It was a port city, so a lot of, a lot of goods, a lot of stuff flowed through there. Very wealthy, like Ephesus. Um, it was also very proud of its reputation as a city where worship of the Roman emperors was done with much devotion. Okay, that, that's, that's the idea. That, that's what's going on um, in Smyrna. So it's on that backdrop. Um, so if you were a follower of Jesus living in Smyrna, um, and you, for instance, refused to sprinkle incense on the fire, burning in front of the emperor's statue, or you refused to call Caesar your Lord, you would be persecuted for your allegiance to Jesus. Working in tandem against the church with the Roman Empire in Smyrna was a large population of Jews who hated Christians because they saw them as a cult. Okay? Smyrna was not at all a friendly place to live if you were a Christian. Um, there was also economic persecution. Um, believers were prohibited from working many of the best jobs, and that meant that most of the believers were living in genuine poverty. So there were multiple costs to pay for being a believer in Smyrna. Jesus warns his church about a new wave of persecution that would be coming to Smyrna and writes this letter to strengthen the church and reassure his people. Now what he's talking about is Titus's legions, the Roman legions that were sweep through and eventually would get all the way into um, Jerusalem and destroy the temple, burn it to the ground. It was said that the fires that they set in the temple in Jerusalem as Titus invaded um, were so hot that literally, of course, the walls, the interior walls of the temple were covered in pure gold. Um, that, that the gold was so hot that the gold melted and was just laying in, in puddles all over the, the, the floor of the temple. Um, the, the, the stuff that the Romans did when they came through, they, they, would, they would literally, if a woman was pregnant, it didn't matter how pregnant, they would, they would literally, while she was breathing, they would, they would slash open her, her stomach and pull the baby out and just bash its head against rocks. I mean, these people were, shoot, they, they were like messed up. I mean, seriously. And I'm not trying to gross people out. I'm just wanting people to understand what, what would happen when Rome got ticked off and they came through the city. There, there, was, no, there was no sparing of anybody. And, and uh, uh, you know, that's, and it, that's kind of what's happening here. So Smyrna was one of those cities. They paid particular attention to make sure that people were giving homage to Caesar and all those kinds of things. Um, I want us to take a look at four things, four counterintuitive truths from this letter. Okay? Every time we are tempted, and this is the message for today, every time we're tempted, it's an opportunity to be tested and found true. It's an opportunity to be tested and found true. Um, you know, we, 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 think of, we think of temptation as, as, as such a bad thing. Let me say this, temptation is bad or how bad it is, is determined by how we respond to it. Because temptation not responded to has no power over us at all. Now, how many of you today were tempted to do something that that little voice in the back of your head said, you know, you shouldn't really be doing that. Anybody? Oh, come on. Fess up. Yeah. Fess up. Come on. We all are. We're tempted. We're tempted every day. We're tempted in all ways. The Bible says we're tempted you know, in all ways just as he was. Um, or he was tempted in all ways just as we are without sin. See, but that's, that, that's, that's the reality here is that temptation has no power over you until you succumb to it. Amen. Um, that's why Paul talked about the battle of the mind and, and talked about how important that is um, that we cast down those thoughts and all those kinds of things because the battle that takes place isn't here. The battle is in between here. Yeah. That's where the battle is fought. 
Um, you know, that's what that's what Satan did to Eve in the garden. When he got he got he got between her ears. Oh, come on now. Mm -hmm. God knows the day that you eat that, you're going to be just like He is, and He doesn't want to share. He don't want to share with anybody. And she bought into it. She bought into it. And it says, and when she saw that it was good to look at, and that it was going to taste good, and it was able to make you wise. She took it and ate it. And we've been, we've been dealing with that one for, for the rest of, of, of time. That idea of, um, you know, the, the, we, it wasn't enough to be made in the image of God. We wanted to play God. And it got us into trouble. So every time we're tempted, it's an opportunity to be tested and found true. Every time you're tempted to get that last word in, because you're really angry and it's like, I'm not going to let them have the last word. That's a temptation. Because usually that last word is something that usually hurts. Usually hurts pretty bad. Um, it's an opportunity. That, that time when that guy cuts you off in traffic and you so badly want to let them know that they're number one. And um, it's that opportunity. It's an opportunity to be tested and found true. Um, even how, you know, how, how we respond to one another, how we deal with each other, how we, how we you know, all of that. It's, it's, it's counterintuitive, but temptation, all in how you look at it, temptation can be a bad thing if you succumb to it. But if you can look temptation square in the eye, and you can, and you, can um, you know, what was it that said that, that, that I believe it was Cain that God spoke to and said, man, if you don't, ma if you, don't you know, sin is at the door. And if you don't master it, it's going to master you. And, 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 that's, and that's the idea here that we got. That Jesus is telling them, look, you're going to be tempted. But every temptation is an opportunity to be tested and found true. Okay? Um, the second one, a believer's true wealth and treasure is not related to his or her financial assets. Amen. You know, it's just not. It's just not. Some of the wealthiest people in the world and some of the wealthiest people in the kingdom of God are people that never had two nickels to rub together, but man, were they rich in faith and in wisdom and, 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 and those types of things. Um, Jesus says in verse 9, I know your tribulation and your extreme, that's the word, the wording in the Greek, your extreme poverty, but you're really rich. You're really Really rich. Have you ever known somebody seriously that didn't have two didn't have two nickels to rub together, but yet they were some of the most happy people you ever met? And you wonder how in the world they got nothing. They got the holes in their socks have holes in them. How can they be happy? How can they be? And and, and the reality is, is that a lot of times, those, most of the time, those people they've just got a place where. Dude, they've got they found that sweet spot with Jesus. And it's like, I don't worry about it. I don't worry about it. I knew I knew I knew somebody that, that actually was in my home church that, that they, they lived that way. I mean, it was amazing. Nothing ever bothered them. Nothing ever happened and, and whatever and if and if anything ever went wrong or went bad, you know, you'd say, Well, well, how, how are you gonna handle this? Oh, they said, Well, my God will take care of me. I've prayed and he let me know it's okay. And they were they were as happy as clams. Crazy. Just happy as clams. But that is that that is that is the thing that you're extreme and because we have to understand, um, I know your tribulation and your extreme poverty, but you are rich. Could it be that we as believers in the 21st century have really gotten our eyes off of what the true treasure is? In a lot of ways. And I'm not, and I'm not one of these. I'm not a poverty guy or anything else. I got, I got my investments. I'm saving for retirement. I'm doing all that stuff. But the reality is, is that I have learned, I have learned to live with a loose grasp. I'm learning. I'm learning at 60 years old. I'm learning, slowly but surely, to cultivate ears for the Holy Spirit and to be generous. That when the Holy Spirit speaks. I'll, tell, I'll share a story with you. Um, this uh, uh, 
couple of weeks ago, we were at our district, our state um, thing for pastors, and, and so there's a guy here in the state, and um, a missionary that I, that I know is, was planning, he has a trip that he's going on, and, and uh, doing stuff for other pastors and things of that nature, and, and um, there was an item that they really needed, they didn't have the money for, but they really wanted to, to give it to, um, to these pastors and their wives. And he's telling me this story, and, and, and I'm hearing the Holy Spirit saying, take care. And I'm standing there, and I'm thinking, you know, and it's one of those things that get thee behind me, Satan. You know, one of those deals, you know. And, um, but I heard these words, and I told my wife about it today, and we both just sat there in tears. I heard these words because both my parents had died. I heard them because my parents were such unbelievable givers. They gave to people in ways that my sister and I never knew about, only until later on in our lives. And uh, anybody, I mean, just, and I heard these words in my head, son, we can do this. And I first thought, I said, well, that was God. But I now realize that wasn't God at all. I was hearing the voice of my parents because, you know, they had, they had passed and yes, there was some money that transacted and, and, you know, that type of thing. But it was like that spoke to my heart in such a powerful way. And it was like my mom and dad, because that was their heart. I mean, they were, they, my parents, they were unbelievable givers. And, and it's like, it was like they were sitting there speaking to him. The Holy Spirit was speaking to him, but I can tell you, my mom and dad were just like sitting there. They're both in heaven, and I, and I know that. And, and, the, and the thing of it is, is that I'm learning. At 60 years old, I've been learning over the years to hang on to stuff very loosely. To hang on it very loosely. And in other words, to be, to, to be able to just have a generous spirit and be able to cultivate that and say, God, it's all yours anyway. It's all yours anyway. Exactly. So whatever, you know, whatever. <laughs> Even if it don't make sense to me, get thee behind me, Satan. You know, that type. doesn't make sense to me, but, you know, learning that. So a, a, belie a believer's true wealth and treasure is not related to his or her financial assets. Jesus says, I know your tribulation and your extreme poverty, but you are rich. We have to always remember that. Our wealthiness is not made up of George and Ben and Abraham and all those different faces on those dollar bills. We have something that's, that, that, that's much greater. Um, so number three. Um, a fourth and or a third and closely related counterintuitive truth Jesus teaches here is that the world, and, and that's something that the world will not, would not ever understand, is those who do evil are not the source of evil. And we see this in verse 10 when Jesus tells these believers in Smyrna, the devil is about to throw you some of you in prison that you may be tested for 10 days but you, um, and you will have tribulation. Notice who he said is doing it, the devil. I talked about that already. But notice that that is so interesting that Jesus here is teaching a truth that, that it's those who do evil are not the source of the evil. So when people do evil things, now do I believe if somebody breaks the law, should they have to, you know, if you do the crime, you do your time. That's just the way it works. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is as believers, we want to focus on the action more than we want to do the spirit behind the action. And so what, what Jesus is trying to communicate through this, and I believe what John is communicating to us thousands of years later, is he's saying, look, we need to understand when you're living in evil times, it gets so easy to get angry at the person who did the evil rather than the one that is the source of the evil. And sometimes we go, we battle in prayer against a lot of the, I won't say the wrong things, but we, we, our, our aim is off. Our aim is off. We want to do battle in a particular direction when the actual, the enemy is over here that we need to be doing battle with. Right. You know, not, not, not. So it, it, he's trying to get us to understand that, look, those who do evil are not the source of evil. It's the devil. Yes. Yes. 
And you know, and I don't know about you, I get up early in the morning. I'm up usually by five o'clock in the morning, sometimes earlier than that. And, and I read my Bible, I pray, and uh, I, I journal, and then I'll flip on the news just to see what's going on in the world. And it's like, it's amazing. I've almost got to the point where I stopped doing it because usually about 20 minutes into the news, I'm so doggone angry I can't see straight. You know, and it's like, I almost, I have to, I, I'll get up and Tammy says, where are you going? I'm going downstairs to ride the bike. <laughs> and she, she knows what's going on with me. And, and it's like, sometimes it gets so easily to get sucked in. And are there evil people out there? Yes, but we have to realize who is the one that, who is the puppet master manipulating the strings? Yes. And we have, and we have, to, and we have to do battle against what we need to do battle against. Um, you know, what was it Paul said? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. Um, we have to remember that all the time. Um, so we, we, we want to make sure that we're uh, focusing on the right thing and have the view that, that, uh, that Jesus had. I mean, that's how Jesus could forgive everybody. That's how he could do it hanging on. I'm still blown away. I mentioned it earlier. I'm still blown away. Jesus hanging on the cross can sit there and say, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Right. That statement itself seems counterintuitive to me because they were the one they were jabbing him with the spear. They put the nails and you know all the stuff that they did to him, but yet they don't know what they're doing. Makes no sense to me. That is weird. But yet, that is what as believers we're called to do. What would it look like in our world today if believers began to do battle against what is really behind all the junk? Yes. What would it look like? You know, it would, make a, it would make a big difference because when you are focused on the source, which is satanic, then you, there's always room for love and grace. For you to show love and grace to yeah. people. That yeah. if you're focused on them as being the person who hurt you or whatever and all that anger is building, yep. then you cannot show the love and grace of Christ if you're if you're all in that really bad place. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's, it's misdirected. So again, it's a deception of the, of the right. evil one. Yeah. And yeah. that's what's our greatest testimony as Christians right. is showing love. That we can love. still do that. Yeah. yeah, showing, showing grace yeah. to people. Um, well, you know, through the you know teachings, his healing, but the night that he was captured in the garden, where one of uh, the disciples chopped the ear off the Peter, Peter off yeah. of the soldier, he reprimanded him there. You know, that's not the way we deal. With yeah. Live by the sword, you die. By yeah, right. yeah. You know, it's, you know what's interesting about that? Our, our, and I'm gonna tell. You, let me put a shameless plug in here. Um, in October, our good friend Shane Willard is going to be back with us legitimately, for real, not live streaming from Australia. He's finally going to be able to be with us. And and if, if you have never heard Shane, you this guy has got such unbelievable knowledge of just Jewish history. And, and he, he was actually, he was mentored by a Pentecostal um, Jewish rabbi. Um, guy received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and, and he mentored him and taught him. And there is so much stuff that's just un. You just said and you go, wow. Um, but one of the things about that story in the Bible where Peter cut off the servant, and one, I believe it's in the Gospel of Mark, where it gives the servant's name, his name was Malchus. And the wording that's used there about a servant of the high priest, literally in, in, in Greek and Aramaic, means the next in line to the high priest. So this guy, Malchus, was out there leading the people that were coming to arrest Jesus but he was going to be the next in line because Caiaphas was the high priest at that time. He was the next in line to take on that role. But here was the deal. Everybody thinks that Peter just was a, had bad aim. That's not true. Because in the law, it stated that if there was any physical blemish whatsoever, it disqualified that person from being able to be considered as high priest. So, now it takes on a whole new meaning when Peter, Peter, come on, are you kidding me? I mean, how can you miss somebody's head? <laughs> Peter knew exactly what he was doing. He was angry at the, at, at, at the moment when he hit that guy's ear, it, it was forever, it cut his ear off. He was forever going to be maimed. And so that was going to be the end. His, his whole career as wanting to be the high priest was done. 
So what does Jesus do? He reaches down, picks up the ear, and puts it back on and heals it. So the very one who's there to take his life and seeks to be, you know, Jesus is the great high priest. And, and yet, here he is, and Peter does what he does. Jesus not only rebukes Peter, but yet he also has compassion and heals that guy, even though this guy is, he know, Jesus knows that within 24 hours, this guy is going to be one of the leading ones that's going to nail him to that doggone cross. It blows my mind. But that was Jesus. And can you imagine what it would be like if God's people today could just get a hold of about this much of that? Just this much. To be able to demonstrate that around us. Um, so that, that's, that's um, the third one. And then the fourth one is this. And this letter from Jesus is faithfulness to death really leads to life. In the last sentence of verse 10, Jesus says, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And you know what? And we, and we do. that. We're talking about physical death. We understand that. But think about all the other stuff that there is in life for us to die to. I believe that every time when we have to die to ourselves we receive a crown of something in our lives, and our spirits. I believe that. I believe that. I believe that, you know, we think that we're going to have, you know, we read the verse while they're in the book of Revelation, around in the book of Revelation, and they cast their, cast their crowns at His feet. And it's like, okay, I get that, but sometimes I think, you know, we, we think that's one crown. But what, what if every time we do battle with our flesh and we die to ourself so that, so that the power of the gospel, so that the love of the gospel, so that the grace of the gospel can shine through. That every time we die to ourselves, that's another crown. I don't think, to tell you the truth, I don't, I don't think any of us have a clue as to how many, how many crowns that we have waiting for us. You know, when, we, when, we, when we're kind to that person that wasn't kind to us, when we, um, you know, whatever that looks like, when somebody is just being really, really, you'd rather punch them than look at them, basically. You know what I'm saying? But yet we're kind to them. We die a little bit more to ourselves. And Paul, when he talks about the whole battle of the mind, wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, <clears throat> we think about that, that this is something that's this, these demonic forces. I believe it's this. It's the battle between our ears that we have to battle. Because our, our, our weapons are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The biggest stronghold in anybody's life is not what they do out here. It's what's taking place between their ears. And if we can get that, yeah. What is our weapon as believers? Number one is the Word of God. The Word of God. Number two, it's, it, it's prayer. Number three, I believe it's allowing ourselves to die to ourselves. Um, because here's the deal, where, you know, where, where, do the, where, do, where do the evil thoughts come from? And I'm not talking about evil, I'm going to kill this person. I'm just thinking, even just, even just negative thoughts about yourself. Have you ever struggled with negative thoughts about yourself? Yeah. Where, do you really think those are coming from God? No, they're coming from the devil. They're coming from Satan. Yeah. That, that becomes a stronghold to us. Okay. How many things have we not done for the Lord? Not because we're bad people, but because Satan plants a seed between our ears that grows and it becomes a stronghold in our life and we've, and we've convinced ourselves there's no way I can do that because, because such and such. I'm this, I'm that, I'm not this, I'm not that. Yeah, Terry. There's two armies out there. There's an army for God and there's an army for Satan. Yeah. And so you have to make up your mind which army you want to yeah. be on. Yeah. And <coughs> to be on God's army then you have to do exactly what you said. You have to be prayed up, know the word. Yeah. And you have to have all of us. Yeah. God calls every single one of us Christians to be on his army because he needs us. Yeah. To be out there fight, fighting. Satan. Yeah. Not yeah. the people. Not the people, but but to it's be doing but to be doing, you know. Yeah, um, I, I, I believe it was I believe it was Carmen. Anybody in here old enough to remember Carmen? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. You know, um, 
Every, I think every youth group in the country did um, um, uh, did a did a what they called um, human videos to the, the his song the champion. You know, every, I think every youth group in the world did that. Um, but uh, uh, um, but but the idea, I believe it was Carmen who coined this phrase in one of his songs. He said, "It's time to get on our knees and fight like a man." And 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 most of the time, those battles aren't about necessarily what we're facing. It's about tearing down the strongholds that are here. How many, how many people, just because the enemy lies to us all the time, do we, do we miss out on awesome things that God has in store for us? Um, you know, because the Bible says, Paul says in Ephesians, didn't he say this? That we were, we, were, we were created in God to do good works which He had planned before Beforehand for us to accomplish? That's something else. Somebody have their hand raised over here. Yeah. Not to change the subject with um, the fact of God, but you know, if you read some of the books of psychiatry, we talk about the schizoid, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's a voice on your left shoulder, a voice on your right shoulder. Not any different than what God's teaching. Yeah. There's a good voice, there's a bad voice. Yeah. There's a voice telling you, don't do it, it's wrong. There's a voice saying, go ahead. Do it. Look at it over there. It's parallel to the, yeah. to, to the God voice sure. and the devil voice. Yes. Yeah. And, and atheists, they like, try to tell them there's a God. Say, do you believe in that? Yeah. Well, then you should believe in God. Yeah. You know? yeah. um, but the voice you hear is wins that fight. Yes. Yeah. When you really listen to it, right? Yeah. And, and here, here's the deal. Here's the deal. We've all got that voice. That's right. It may not be telling us all the same thing, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to confess something right here. I mean, honesty, so those of you at home, if you can't handle this, turn me off. <laughs> um, but here's the deal. I went through a period of about a year ago that I had to go, I had to go get some counseling um, because I, was, I, would, I had suffered all my life. I had dealt with all my life a voice that constantly told me I wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. I was good. But I wasn't quite good enough. So what that does to you is, as you grow up is that no matter what you accomplish and what you do, you hear that yes. voice saying, yeah, that was good, but you could have done better. And so you find yourself then getting, getting angry about things. And, all of, and it was amazing. You add all the stuff going on with all the shutdowns and just people dying and dealing with all the stuff. And it was just, it was at this point where it's because I, I got to, I got I got I got to get me some get some help, and so I went I went to a guy, a good Christian counselor. I, I trust him and he, and everything. And when I explained to him, he said he said I can tell you exactly what's happening. He said it's like you're in the driver's seat on a bus, but there's a guy in the back of the bus who's constantly telling you how to drive. And he says there comes a point in time where you have to determine who's driving the bus, and you have to tell the voice in the back of the bus to shut up. So sometimes you may pass me on in early in the morning as I'm driving into the office. If you pass me and you stop by a traffic light and I'm talking to myself, more than likely, it's because I'm telling that voice to shut up. You're not driving the bus today. And that simple truth, be here between here, that simple truth made all the difference in the world. Amen. And it was a stronghold in my life that I had to, I had to. Man, I had to wrestle with, and I had to, I had to cast that sucker down, and I have to do it every day. I have to do it every day, and 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 there's a there's a long history. You know, don't try to psychoanalyze me because it, it would, we'd be here all night. I've trust me, I've psychoanalyzed myself enough of where that all comes from. But there, there there's I can track it back all the way back to when that first started, and and dealing with that. And, and it's amazing the stuff that, that goes on. As I, you know, I would suggest to anybody in here, if, you, if, you, if you've got that voice that's trying to reinforce negative images of you that are not true, I'm going to tell you what, you need to start talking to and let that, let that voice tell it to shut up, that it's not driving the bus, you are. And you see, when I, when I decide to drive the bus, it's amazing what my thought processes are. It's the things that Jesus says about me. That's the voice I listen to. I choose to tune out the negative, and I choose to tune in what God says about me. Amen. And you can say, well, that's self-help gobbledygook. No, it's not. It's stuff. 
it, it, it stuff literally it set me free it set me free because I can I can catch myself when I would get angry at somebody I would ca I can catch myself now and go you know what that's stupid I don't you're not driving the bus now and so those things those battles it's exactly right here. You know, be faithful unto death and I'll give you a crown of life and 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 that that the faithfulness to death really leads to life dying to ourselves and being willing to say Lord it's not what it's not what I want, but it's what you want. And that can be hard. I'm not standing here saying it's easy. It can be hard. Um, but until we can, we, when we reach that, it's amazing. Um, it's amazing how the grip or the ability, the, the, the attempts of Satan to get a hold of us are... Uh, are, are made, uh, how they, they, he wants to get a hold of us, but yet if we can if we can fight that fight under the power of the Holy Spirit, it's amazing what happens. Because here, here's here's the here's the thing that happens. Um, I had a friend of mine. He was an evangelist. His name was Jacob Aranza, and uh, he was in New York City, and um, he was coming across the street, and he had kind of a New York kind of an attitude, um, and and this guy in this big old limo. Right as he's coming across the crosswalk, the guy pulls up. And if you've ever been in New York City, you take your life in your hands just stepping off the curb. I mean, it's pathetic. Um, but this guy pulls right in front of him and blocks the crosswalk. And he said, the guy's in the back seat of the limo. Got this big stogie in his mouth and just kind of looking at him like, I don't know who you think you are. And, the, <laughs> and Jacob said, he said, he said I, was just, I was so mad. He said, I, I opened up the door, the back door of the limo, got in, scooted across, got out the other side, and went and finished walking into the store. And he, he said, said, I couldn't believe that. And he's in the store. And as he's in there, a guy walks in, pulls out a gun to rob the store. Can you imagine a day like that? I mean, you, you, you know, you, you're feeling pretty good. You, you ticked off the guy with the stogie, and you... And you you know, because he, but so he's in this store, and and the guy looks him square in the eyes, and he, he says, "Man, he said you better put your hands up." And he said, "He said I'm not putting my hands up." He said, "The guy said, what do you mean you're not putting your hands?" He said, "Because you're not going to hurt me." He said, "Man, I'll shoot you right here." <laughs> Jacob looked at him. And he said, "Go ahead. You can't kill a dead man." And the guy looked at him like, oh my gosh, this dude's nuts. And turns around and walks out of the store. He just walks out of the store. And it's like, but he, but he, 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 said, that, he said, that was a mentality that the, that the Holy Spirit began to put into me about everything I encountered. You know, there, there's something out there that, that wants this to kill something inside of me. We don't have to quit breathing to be killed little by little on the inside. But when you can understand who you are in Christ, and you can understand that you know no weapon formed against you can prosper. You begin to say, you know what? You can't kill it. Take your best shot. You can't kill a dead man. I refuse to listen to that voice anymore. I refuse to function out of fear. I refuse to think, well, man, people are going to think I'm crazy if I talk to this wait waitress because the Holy Spirit's telling me to. People are going to think you're crazy because you walk up to somebody in the store because God tells you to and you give them a gift card or whatever the case may be. You know, people are going to think I'm nuts. Shut up, voice. You can't kill a dead man. I'm, I'm dead to that. And, and so that's what, I believe that's the message that John is trying to get across here. Um, I'm going to stop with that. Any, any comments or anything like that? You guys have been awesome. Thank you for your, your input and everything. Anything else? Yeah. I think the <clears throat> biggest and hardest thing for me was when I hear a voice and it took me a long time to realize that it was God, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit talking to me. Mm -hmm. The one, one of the times it really gets, and it still hurts, mm -hmm. but in a good way. Mm -hmm. I was working at my brother-in-law's house fixing something, and as I was ready to leave, the Holy Spirit told me, "Go see Chuck." Now this Chuck lived two blocks from my brother-in-law. Chuck and I used to ride motorcycles together with the CMA. Mm -hmm. Chuck had um, 
shingles real bad where he was in, in the hospital and he was finally home. He was in rehab. He said, go take Chuck out to lunch. I said, Lord, I'm tired. I want to go home. He said, I'm driving away. And he said, I'm telling you, go take him to lunch. I says, well, it's got to be you. So I turned, went, or called. I says, all right, Lord, if he answers, I'll go and pick him up and take him to lunch. And he answers, so I okay. So I go and I pick him up and we go out, we eat, we come back, uh, <clears throat> he gives me a big hug, and we tell each other that we love each other. Next morning he was dead. Hmm. Mm. If I wouldn't have listened and gone back to see Chuck, I wouldn't be able to live with that today. Yeah. Of not doing what he told me. So if that little angel on this side, or no, right, he's always on the right side, tells you to do something, you better do it. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Because it could hurt you in the long run. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That is so, so true. Um, but Father, we love you. God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you, God, that no matter what our situations are that we're facing, Father, let us rest in the fact that you have everything under control.